good morning, it's me again. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so after natural history, then I want to go into the guidelines. So with guidelines here, I'm not going to talk about the guidelines for the treated patient. I've just shared with you some of the guide, what the guidelines says when we assess patients who are positive, when we assess patients who are inactive, when should we start treatment. So here I want to focus on the guideline on news. Because we're going to have a deep discussion on PET interferon in the next session. So I'll try to leave the interferon discussion uh, in the next session. So I'll look into the kind of news where they solve the problem already. So here's the guideline. So these are the recommended treatment for hepatitis B. You can see that lamivudine and tamivudine and tamivudine are not recommended anymore, mainly because of the risk of resistance and also for some of them the potency of viral suppression. So nowadays, antithavir, tenofovir, diproxyfumarate, TDF are recommended by all associations. And because the parcel has not updated its guideline after 2016, and tenofovir elephantamide was introduced in 2017, so you cannot see TA yet in the parcel guideline. But frankly speaking, I think a lot of Asian countries are using it when it's available. So these drugs have a very low risk of drug resistance. They are very, very potent. So yeah, we can use it long term, but then talk to a lot of your friends or even your own self or your patients. They find it's okay to take a tablet a day. And with no resistance, and if the cost is borne by you, then what's the problem? So it has a guideline already solved the problem. So let's see what it has achieved with all these drugs. Now, number one is process reversion. So this is important, and we just noticed in about 10 years with the news that fibrosis can be reversed, cirrhosis can be reversed. So with long-term antiquitin treatment, long-term TTF treatment, we do see fibrosis regression, and we do see cirrhosis regression. And with that, we can also see that uh, among cirrhotic patients, the hepatic events can be reduced. So this is just one of the examples uh, we conducted in Hong Kong in more than 480 uh, ETV-treated patients versus historic control. With antagonist treatment, we reduce the all hepatic event by half, we reduce XCC by half, we reduce different mortality by 70-80%, and we reduce all cause mortality by 60-70%. So it's very, very useful. And in the ACLD guideline last year, uh, uh, it's recommended that there's actually no difference between tenofovir and tenofovir regarding long-term complication of bone and renal risk. And they mainly cited one study, it's actually conducted in Hong Kong, a tertiary-wide database analysis of more than 53,000 patients followed for 4.7 years. The risk of bone complication and renal complication is very, very low. Although it seems that apophia, in particular, has slightly higher risk of hip fracture than tenofovir. Uh, and at that time, because tenofovir, the TDF was not extensively used in Hong Kong, uh, in our study, uh, it only represents a very, very small group of patients that we did not conclude the problem of tenofovir in, in our study. But anyway, the label of TDF, it also highlights the problems because of renal safety and bone safety. So in all the guidelines I just extracted this from ASLD recommendation, is we need to monitor renal safety in using serum creatinine phosphate because of the tubular loss of phosphate, you may also see a, high, a low phosphate level in some of our, our patients. And you need to monitor urine glucose and urine protein. Again, this reflects tubular damage and they should be assessed before treatment and periodically at least annually. There's no evidence suggests for or against bone mineral density monitoring. It's because of the risk of osteoporosis. If you read the, uh, 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 most of the studies, the evidence is very controversial and bone mineral density monitoring requires exposure to CT scan, to radiation. So actually, it's very hard to recommend whether we should or should not do it. But however, if we suspect TDF-associated renal dysfunction or osteoporosis or simulation, we should discontinue TDF or we should consider another drug. And if patients have renal impairment, we have to adjust those. So all these recommendations suggest that TDF may not be as safe as we think, although all the data suggests it is very, very safe. But the reason it's safe 
is because we know how to use it. And probably we have already reduced the dose when we see uh, a suspected limb impairment, and therefore, in the long run, we do not see fracture. So, that's the reason why we have the new drug, tenofovir I will spend a few slides on that because that's one new thing that I think we need to know. Uh, for, so, TDF is actually a program because tenofovir free tenofovir is not biologically available. So, we need to form a program using a so called carrier that is a BF to combine with. Tenofovir. But the TTF is not stable in the plasma. So once it's absorbed, most of the drug will be released, all the free tenofovir will, will be released, and only a very small portion will go to the liver, where it is phosphorylated into the active form. And more than 96% of free tenofovir will be excreted through the kidney, but in some patients, because of accumulation of free tenofovir in the renal tubules, it causes renal tubular damage. And that's the reason why you see phosphorus leakage, and then which is also to porosis, and some patients may also have a renal function impairment. But tenofovir-alafenamide is a change of carrier from DF to AF, and this is a very stable form in plasma, and almost all of them are transported to the liver before it is phosphorylated. Therefore, we see a very, very low amount of free tenofovir in the plasma, and therefore we can only use 25 mg daily instead of 300 mg daily to achieve almost the same level of TDF, uh, tenofovir inside the liver. And the key study is actually a phase 3 study. Uh, uh, one in the negative patient, one in the positive patient, totaling about 1,300 patients altogether. Initially, it's a two-year uh, randomized study plus three years of open-label study. But subsequently, FDA rec uh, recommended a change of protocol in a three-year randomized and five more years of open-label uh, studies. And the pivotal study has been presented repeatedly in many, many meetings. And the one-year data was published uh, last year. Uh, the e positive paper was led by myself, e negative paper by Maria Beauty in Lancet GI. So just to summarize the data, so this is 96 feet data. Actually, we already had the three-year data uh, presented. But anyway, the trend is very, very similar. So TARF actually shows very similar viral suppression, high rates of AOG normalization as compared to TDF, it's better renal and bone safety, and we switch from TDF to TAF, we can also improve the bone and mineral and, and, and bone safety in 24 weeks, and we did not see viral resistance. So in other words, we, I do not call TAF a renewed drug, but if some somewhat a facelift version of of TDF. It's almost like when you buy cars after three years, the face lift a little bit and then it's a new car, a new model. But at least it's safer uh, than, than TDF. So Isogana actually updated the recommendation of how to use these drugs. And in general, TDF and Technophia and TAF are the same for most patients. So it all depends on local preference or local practice, the cost of drugs and all other factors uh, that, that influence your, your prescription. But however, TDF is actually less recommended if patient is older, if patient has got bone disease, like chronic steroid use, history fracture, fracture osteoporosis, or have got renal impairment, like low UGFR, aluminuria, low phosphate, or hemodialysis, we better choose antechofia or TAF, which is actually uh, 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 marketed as vanity. So for those patients with previous exposure to NA, particularly immunity resistance, and then we do not want to use the antechofia, and then TAF is more preferred. And also with HIV co-infection or in patients with very, very low preliminary uh, and you do not want to trust a dose, then preferably TAF is preferred over ETV. Um, but if you want to more adjust the dose, then definitely ETV can, can also be used. So this is what the guideline uh, help us when we have a new uh, drug coming. Well, the guideline Although it, it tells us that we can continue the drug to use the drug, but it has not solved all the problems. So I want to raise a few problems to you. Number one is XTC is reduced, but it's not eliminated. And actually, it's highlighted in our first by our first speaker. Again, this is one study uh, from Hong Kong looking into ETV treated cirrhotic patients. So the blue line are those patients with DNA suppressed to undetectable level, and the green line are patients with DNA suppressed, but still detected. And here you can see that if a patient on DTV 
even there's no resistance ratio, if the virus cannot be completely suppressed, we still see a slightly higher mortality as compared to those on the same drug, but DNA being suppressed. And this is echoed by a very recent paper from Korea. So this, again, a Korean paper looking into cirrhotic patients, 337 of them, with low viremia, that is uh, in less than 2,000, but all uh, antiviral treatment, at the or antiquivir, versus an out of about 500 patients with DNA undetectable. So undetectable one is a red line, and low viremia is a blue line. And you can see that in the cirrhotic patient, in both groups, we still see uh, uh, liver cancer, but it's much higher in patients who have a low viremia. In other words, we do not want to see DNA, even there's no drug resistance, in an NA suppressed patient. So what can we do about it? Can we combine drugs? So this is one famous study, the below study published by Professor Anna Long and her group, combining ETV and TDF versus DTV alone. And they found that in the possibility of high viral load, more than eight logs, it seems that combo therapy has a high proportion of patients to reach undetectable DNA after two years of treatment as compared to EDV alone. So, however, this study has one drawback, is that there's no TDS monotherapy up, and we never know whether TDS monotherapy can, can already achieve what the combo therapy arm can achieve. So this is what this study cannot address. But go back to our email tolerance study that I highlighted in my last joke. Combining TDF and anthracitabine seems to achieve a better DNA suppression than TDF alone. In patient again, E positive, very high viral load. And now you can see that anthracitabine will never be more potent than TDF monotherapy. We do not need an anthracitabine monotherapy arm to, to conclude that. So I think that in some patients, in very, very high viral load patients, probably combination therapy can have a higher chance to achieve uh, undetectable DNA, but that's probably an increment of less than 10% probability. Well, that's not the end of the story, because in the pivotal study of TDF registration, the 102-103 study, actually for those patients with detectable DNA, after 72 weeks, they have a chance to choose whether to use TDF monotherapy or they continue combo therapy. But after five years, it seems that only 60% to 70% of these patients can achieve antitemporal DNA no matter what they choose. In other words, I think right now there's still no conclusion for those patients who fail to achieve antitemporal DNA on NA without drug resistance. What shall we do? Shall we add another NA or should we just leave it alone? So it seems there's no evidence suggesting either side. And therefore, in the ASLD guideline, there's also some recommendation, uh, even the, in the most updated guideline, there's an 18 recommendation. It states that these patients, we call persistent low viremia, less than 2,000 IU per on ETU or TDF. The recommendation is just to continue treatment. And we have to ensure drug adherence, we make sure that well, there is no, no drug resistance in these patients. And, 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 and there are some patients like this, for example, with a positive patient, probably 20% or quarter of them may still have this problem. And the negative patient, probably less than 10% of this patient might still have this problem. So all in all, we still see these patients, and, and um, with the current antiviral treatment, we still cannot achieve maximal uh, benefit for them. But how often does e serial conversion occur? So you read the period, I just like the the registration trials here for one year and year four to five is your commercial break. And year four to five is not entirely the same for all the studies. Actually, for some studies, it is only about 20% of the patient cohort. So it's actually not for head to head comparison, but at least you know that yeast conversion only occurs in less than half of your patient if you continue treating them for four to five years. So although the guideline recommends that there's a chance of stop treatment, but the real chance is less than half in four to five years, even in one stop treatment. But this is still too optimistic because all those studies are from registered trials, and those trials are patients in immune active phase. If we treat immune tolerant patients, as I highlighted, ECU conversion rate 0% to 5%. So if you want to treat immune tolerance patients, even as guideline that you can stop treatment after ECU conversion, 
Unfortunately, you never see it. So this is not the best group of patients you want to treat if you think about a final duration of any treatment. So if you pull all data together, okay, this is a very nice crude analysis uh, published by uh, George Pepin Theodoridis uh, of 25 studies. And patients following the recommendations to stop treatment, although it's extremely heterogeneous, what the response is being defined. In general, DNA should be less than 20,000 either mil. Some studies use 2,000, some studies use 200. It's extremely heterogeneous. But I want to show you two phenomena here. Number one is if you look at the proportion of patients still remain in remission, it goes down with time. So in other words, even if I stop treatment, after one year, less patient remain in remission. After another year, again, less patient in remission. The second thing is the inactivation. patient. The inactivation patient tend to remain in remission less often than the positive patient. So it's much difficult to stop treatment in the next patient, only 30% of patients remain in remission after three years, even if we follow this guideline to stop. So let's look at the next patient. So we've conducted a study uh, prospectively looking at 184 next on DPV, and we stopped treatment according to parcel guideline. Uh, you can say that we trust the guideline, or you can say that we distrusted the guideline. But anyway, we found that 90% of patients actually got DNA relapse after one year, most of them actually DNA reactivated after half a year, we stopped treatment. And we, re we retreated our patients. So we could not tell how many patients have got real flares because we, we, we were not brave enough at that time. Our Taiwanese colleagues are braver because of the national reimbursement policy. They have to stop the treatment after three years because the drug is no more reimbursed. So they're very, very good series uh, published. Um, this is just one of the examples, 95 in any patient to the ETV stopped according to parcel guideline and it found that again, a lot of the patients got viral relapse. The key thing is about 45% of patients have some clinical relapse. In other words, they've got high DNA plus an AOG more than two times of the normal. So this lesson tells us one important thing is viral relapse does not equal to biochemical relapse. Not all patients with DNA comes back, we have LD go up. The issue is, should you treat? Because if the DNA is going up, LD is not as high as two times up to normal. For example, 1.5 times up to normal. Should you treat? So this is actually one dilemma that we have solved when we talk about stopping uh, treatment in these patients. But in Europe, there are much better uh, results. So this is the first study. Um, uh, uh, being presented in Europe, and more studies are actually coming, and you will see more studies being presented in, in, in WSLD about stopping treatment in Europe. But in the first study, actually, Thomas Webb presented this uh, uh, three years ago at ESO, and the paper was published last year in J Pathology. Uh, so they randomized in patient on TDF uh, for more than four years to stop TDF rope versus continue TDF rope. And what they found was if they stop TDF, Number one, all patients got DNA detectable. So this is exactly the same what we found in, in Hong Kong. And some patients get very serious flares. One patient get LT drop up to 983. Another patient got LT drop to 559. And uh, LT elevation more than two times of normal is in 57% patients. So very compatible with our Taiwanese college show. So at least in terms of LT reactivation, DNA reactivation, European and Asian are very, very similar. The interesting thing is that the SAG, which is actually not well documented in Asian cohorts, because we retreated our patient and they did not retreat their patients, almost for everyone. And we found that HPSC level actually fluctuated and some with a very dramatic drop if you stop TBF. In contrast to those who continue TBF, the HPSC level is very flat. So what does it mean? It actually means that if you stop the, stop the new, probably it stimulates the host immune response. And there are some studies, and actually the few very data studies conducted in Germany, showing the reactivity of T-cells. And this may lead to a second immune clearance. And some patients with successful immune clearance lead to HPSH loss. And in most European studies, the, all of them are extremely small, only 20-30 patients. 
but they already found that about 20% of their patients, or even up to 30% of their patients, record service engine loss just by stopping new strategy. Well, of course, we can think about other ways to stop new. Then this is not in the guidelines yet, but this is already published in some uh, Asian studies. So this is uh, uh, the first study we call the OSST study, a famous study conducted by Ning Qing's uh, group, uh, uh, a multi-center study in China. They look into Yi population who have a low Yi engine level, or they have lost Yi engine, and they randomize them into pet interferon alpha 2A for one year, versus continue ETV, and it found that 8.5% of patients on the pet interferon group have S loss, as compared to 0% in the continue ETV group. So this is a very huge difference, but the 8.5%, remember, is still much, much lower than what our European friends reported in 20-30%. So I believe that there must be a big difference between Asian and, and Caucasian patients when we stop NA. But anyway, if, we, if a patient has a lower HPSH baseline, in this study less than 1,500 IE per mil, 20% of patients have S loss. And there's another study, a, uh, a new switch study, a game multi center study in China, very published very recently, uh, uh, the full paper been published very recently. So there are two group patients randomized in a one year versus two year pack interferon treatment. But at the end of one year, that is all patients can have results assessed, 11.5% have S loss. So very comparable to OSSD study. A baseline SH less than 1,500, a quarter of them can have S loss. And week 24, again, on the S level also predict S loss. So probably, this is a new strategy we can think about to, um, to, to induce service engine loss. It's not in the guideline yet, but probably with more data, um, I think in the future guideline, they have to integrate how to manage top NA and also how to manage using interferon switch on NA treated patients. So to sum up the guidelines, I think guidelines are good. Um, we, all, we can almost solve the problem, but there are some challenges remain. Number one is long-term treatment. Um, the uh, T TEF and also adafinomide probably might have already solved the dilemma between efficacy of treatment and also blood resistance, bone renal safety. And if you think about it, if I try to roll you back in the mid nineties, think about a perfect NA. What is it? You cannot stop a drug. It's an NA. But if it is Highly efficacious, no resistance, very, very safe, can treat all resistance, unsteady, oral, probably this is the best thing we can achieve with NA. And even if you invent a new NA, one more NA, two more NA, you may not add extra mileage to it. We need newer drugs, as our first lecturer uh, told us. The second thing is that even with NA, we cannot completely suppress the virus. Not to say cure, even suppression. A lot of patients still have detected DNA, and we are not able to handle it yet. And these patients have poorer outcome than those with undetectable DNA. And the third is, again, we don't know how to stop it. There's, there's some data suggesting that stopping treatment might induce a second immune clearance that may lead to S loss. But these are mainly restricted to Caucasian data, and we have also need to address the safety because there are actually cases of liver failure. Actually, I just heard one case presented by Professor Lim Yung Sook in Seoul uh, when he uh, gave a talk in my symposium in Hong Kong. It's a 30-something-year-old lady, stop NA, and when liver failure required a transplant. So one case is enough to overweigh all the benefits of S loss in a few color cases. So we need to know how when to stop treatment and when the can be useful. So with that, I want to thank you very much. <laughs>